Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President of the United States and Mrs. Bush. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and Mrs. Reagan. I'm not going to cut them off. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led by Olympic gold medal winner in America's sweetheart, Mary Lou Retton. And remain standing for the national anthem and Texas Our Texas to be sung by Nancy Ames and the Houston Baptist University Singers. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mary Lou Retton. to lead the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please remain standing now. Excuse me. Can you see So proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleam, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the ramparts we watched were so gallantly spring and the
You know, the United States is involved under this president in something very important. All these pollsters tell you it's the most important thing in terms of family and neighborhood and environment, and that is the battle on against drugs. And I can think of no single citizen in the United States that has done more to help in educating, on that demand side, educating the young people in this country against the use of narcotics. No one has done more than Nancy Reagan. And we all owe her a tremendous <laughs> vote of thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Bill and Rita. Thank you very much. You've made me very proud indeed. And Jack Raines, our dinner chairman, our other governors, Governor Shivers, Governor Connolly, Mr. Vice President and Barbara, Nancy, and Senator-to-be very shortly, Phil Graham. Mrs. Tower, you ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry that, as you all are, that John had to be in Washington tonight. He's helping keep the government running. Come to think of it, I may be doubly sorry. Uh, the, the, it's always wonderful to visit you folks, but I must admit Texas has really been outdoing itself lately. I. Uh, a member of my staff told me that when he was in Dallas, he got in a cab and asked to be taken to the convention. He was, Dallas was kind of strange to him. And the cab driver asked him, well, where is it being held? Well, he didn't exactly know how to tell him where it was being held. So he said, well, it's a place, you know, there's a whole lot of people there and they're shouting and stomping and waving flags and having a heck of a time. And the cab driver turned around and said, buddy, you're just describing the whole state of Texas. And I've, I've covered a good deal of territory since we started this campaign year, and everywhere I go, I see the same kind of spirit, confidence, and pride. America has left uncertainty behind, along with inflation, stagnation, and weakness. And on November 6th, we're going to leave behind, once and for all, those politicians who gave us economic decline and national malaise. In 1980, we promised the American people a new beginning. Our opponents and their economic gurus were saying that it couldn't be done even before we got started. And they were right. If we'd stuck to their policy, it couldn't have been done. Instead, we set out an entirely new path. Our goal was a fundamental change of direction. Instead of taxing away more and more of the working people's earnings, as was the case between 1976 and 81, we gave the people a 25% across the board cut in their tax rates. Instead of throwing up our hands and claiming the growth in federal spending was beyond control, we cut the growth rate in federal spending by more than 50%. Instead of centralizing more and more power in Washington, we've turned back programs to the states in the form of block grants. 62 categorical federal grants have been put into 10 block grants. And that reduced our own administrative overhead for managing them from 3,000 employees to 600. And, <laughs> And it also reduced the number of pages of regulations for all of them from 885 pages to 30 pages. 
Instead of smothering our most productive citizens with red tape, we've trimmed away useless and counterproductive regulations, as you can see. And yes, instead of increasing the number of federal employees, we've nearly 75,000 fewer non-defense federal employees than there were three years ago. Our aim has been to unleash the most productive power the world has ever known, the genius and energy of the American people. Our opponents, who had their chance to prove their stuff and failed miserably, place their faith in Washington programs, high taxes, federal bureaucracy, and government mandates. Well, we place our faith in the people. Our efforts are aimed not at harnessing the American people, leaving the politicians holding the reins, but instead on freeing them. And they haven't let us down. There's a new spirit of teamwork alive in America. Management, labor, and state and local government have figured out that we're all on the same team, the American team. And isn't it good to see America, instead of punting on third down, scoring touchdowns again? Those who are striving to divide America against itself by appealing to envy are finding out that Americans are too good to turn against each other. By working together, we're building a stronger and more vibrant America in which everyone will be better off. After several years of decline, productivity is rising again. Real weekly earnings in the last two years have increased by 3.2%. But in 1979 and 80, in just those two years, they actually fell by 8.8%, the worst drop since World War II. You tell me whose policies are more fair to the working people of America. Small business opportunities are exploding, and a whole new class of entrepreneurs representing a cross-section of our people is emerging. In what Europe is calling the American miracle, almost seven million new jobs have been created. Auto sales are up, interest rates are on the way down, and growth is robust and inflation is low. The predictions of the so-called economic experts have been wrong, wrong, wrong. The question we have to ask is, does anyone really want to go back to the policies of the past? Well, things are going so well, our opponents in this election don't seem to know what to talk about. So they've decided to offer the voters a bold new idea. And what is this new proposal? Raise your taxes. Isn't that novel? <laughs> now, about the only difference between today and 12 years ago is that back then George McGovern's big idea was to give everybody $1,000. Today they want to tax more than that away from you, and then some. Raising taxes will accomplish nothing but cutting the legs out from under economic growth. Is there any wonder why increasing the tax load is about as popular with the American people as a skunk at a lawn party? <laughs> the difference between the two parties is as clear in this election or more clear than at any time in the last 50 years. We Republicans offer more growth, lower tax rates, and a stronger America. Our opponents are still wed to the policies of lower expectations, bigger government, and higher taxes. In foreign policy, the differences are just as great. Both the political parties want to reach arms control agreements with the Soviet Union. The difference lies in the fact that we believe it's best to negotiate with America's adversaries from a position of strength, as you've been told. <clears throat> And our opponents, as Vice President Bush has observed, keep mistaking weakness for peace. And having mentioned George, and believe me, I am deeply grateful for what I've sat here and heard him say, but I'm grateful for more than that. Let me just tell you that Texas couldn't have given a president a better vice president than George Bush. He is, in every sense of the word, an invaluable part of our administration, 
and we thank you for lending him to us. He, you know something? After a few years, George has been in more than 50 countries. He's been a part of every decision that we've made. I can't tell jokes about vice presidents anymore. <laughs> you've loaned me another great Texan, Jim Baker. This local boy. This local boy keeps things running smoothly at the White House, and I rely on him as chief of staff and my right-hand man. And of course, this is nothing new. Americans have been relying on Texans since about 1845. All of us, all of us like you, believe that we must be firm in our commitments and firm in our resolve to protect American interests. Almost a year ago, I was faced with a tough decision. Communist thugs had just murdered Maurice Bishop and other leaders of the government of Grenada. The lives of numbers of American medical students were in jeopardy. The governments of nearby island democracies with little military protection of their own asked for our help. We took action, and yet it took weeks for certain would-be American leaders to decide whether our action had been justified or not. Even, even after seeing the overwhelming display of gratitude from the people of Grenada, there were those who cast aspersions on what we did there, suggesting that it was in some way akin to what the Soviet Union was doing in Afghanistan. Well, I've had some time to reflect on what happened in Grenada, and I can tell you we have no apologies. Our military personnel acted in the finest tradition of our country. They are truly heroes, every one of them. Four years ago, our adversaries and even our friends were counting us out. Defeatism was the order of the day. Well, America is back and we are rebuilding our defenses. And we have again assumed our role as the leading force for freedom in the world. We have a forceful and articulate individual, Gene Kirkpatrick, representing us in the United Nations. When we came to Washington, we faced a near crisis in Central America, a crisis that could over time have resulted in a direct threat to our southern border. Despite the roadblocks thrown in our way by some liberals in the House of Representatives, we've prevented what might have become or mushroomed into a major catastrophe in Central America. The danger isn't gone, but I'm proud to say not one square inch of territory has been lost to communist aggression in the world in these last three and a half years. It's vital that we make certain the voters understand how important it is to elect a Congress which will support our efforts to keep America growing and building, to keep America strong and proud. Now, there's some fine people running for the House here in Texas, and I know you're putting out the maximum effort to get them elected. I understand that your voter registration efforts have been tremendous. Senator Tower and so many others of you are doing a fantastic job. And let's make certain that on Election Day, the voters send Phil Graham to the United States Senate. <laughs> Phil has proven himself a courageous representative of the values in which we so fervently believe. Never before, I believe, in our governor's history has someone decided having just been elected to office, that he could no longer follow the dictates of the leadership of that party. And he changed. But he did more than that. He then resigned and returned to the voters who had sent him there as a member of one party and said, look, you can register your approval or disapproval of what I've done. You'll have to vote on me again in a special election. And they sent him back to Washington as they should.
Winston Churchill once said, when he changed parties in his country, he said, some men change principle for party, and some men change party for principle. Phil has proven himself a courageous representative of, in all of this, as I say, in what we fervently believe. Well, those values are attracting millions to our cause. We're reaching out to rank and file Democrats and independents, asking them to come with us and walk down this new path of hope and opportunity. I know there are many here tonight. I'm very proud to know that you would come here. There was a certain uh, sacrifice at the box office for you to do so. But to have you here, and I just want to say to all of you, having been a Democrat most of my life myself, and found that there came a day when I could no longer follow the policies of the leadership of that party. I know that throughout this country there are millions of rank-and-filed patriotic Democrats who love this country, who want the same things that we want for the country, and yet who find themselves unable to bless the decisions of the policymakers at the head of their own party today. Come with us on this particular march and we'll truly have a bipartisan victory that will set this country to going forward again with your help. The great strength of our cause reflects our devotion to values that are so dear to the American people. Respect for work, love of family, neighborhood, and country, and faith in God. And if all of us remain true to these values, nothing can hold America back. Between now and November 6th, don't let up. I know that I can count on all of you. I have to, though, say something a little non-political in concluding here. I've been saying it all day throughout your state, and I've been saying it in other states, too. I don't know of anything in these four years that has made me more proud than the young men and women that are wearing our uniform today. You know, I've told them sometimes and reminded them in of what? Your dream for 10 years? Yeah. To what? You want? Yeah, take the yes, take it and give it. Yes. They, they will give it to me. They, they'll see that I get it. Ma'am, they'll see that I get it. Honest, they will. And thank you very much. Thank you. And if you couldn't hear, she said, thank you, America. And now, if I can now, let me just go back to those young men and women that I was telling you about. I know sometimes you're going to see them on the street in the uniform and so forth. If you haven't thought about it before, maybe you uh, kind of smile and say hello and even shake their hands. You'll feel real good after you've done it, and I know how good they'll feel. They are they're what George Marshall said of their grandfathers. Back in World War II, when somebody asked George Marshall, what was the secret of our success? What was our secret weapon? And General George Marshall said, the best damn kids in the world. And that's what we have again. Now, about those polls, don't get carried away. President Dewey told me that we should get out the vote. So, all of you. Do what you're doing, and God bless you, and thank you for what you have done. Right. Thank you. Super. Well done. Very good. Very good.
May we ask Vice President Bush, Governor Shivers, Governor Shivers, Governor Clements, Congressman Graham, will you please come up? We've asked the Vice President, Congressman Graham, Governor Shivers, Governor Clements, to join us here, join the President on the podium, while we ask uh, the Honorable Louis Welch, the former Mayor of Houston, the President of the Chamber of Commerce now, to deliver the benediction, uh, after which we'll have the pleasure of hearing Nancy Ames sing America the Beautiful. Mayor Louis Welch. The first prayer this evening was beautifully delivered by Nancy Ames when she sang, God bless you, Texas, and keep you brave and strong, that you may grow in power and worth throughout the ages long. The last prayer of the evening will be delivered again by Nancy Ames when she sings, America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. America has sung its prayers, and will you join with me in one of the greatest prayers ever sung by Americans? Our Father's God to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might. Great God, our King. Amen. Por cielos espaciosos y sus campos de ámbar, por montes majestuosos y las frutas del solar. Nancy Ames to you and the Houston Baptist Choir, to Danny Ward, 
to the orchestra. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please remain in your seats while the President and Mrs. Reagan and Vice President and Mrs. Bush depart the hall. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your generosity. Above all, thank you for your support.